All right, good evening, everyone. Welcome to our continuation of our Shi'urim leading up to this Yom Tov of Pesach. It's it's. Sorry about that. In our Zoom series leading up to Pesach, so this Shir Amir Tzashem, we're going to try to do something a little bit different. Up until now, we've been focusing a bit more on the technical or mechanistic details of the Yom Tiv. So tonight, we're going to try to focus a bit more on how to go ahead and make our Seder preparation a bit more impactful and meaningful. And we're going to try to divide uh, tonight's conversation into a couple of different parts. Maybe beginning first with, uh, with my wife, with the rabbits, and discussing a bit more from the perspective of children. In terms of how do we engage our children a bit more in the Seder? How do we make it a meaningful and impactful experience for them? And then uh, after Aviva, focus a bit more on the adult perspective. And really focusing from the adult perspective, focusing on the idea of the Seder as a meaningful event for adults but also focusing specifically this year in the new reality in which many people will be alone for the Seder and how to find meaning when you lack the normal familial trappings of the Yom Tov of Pesach. So much of Pesach is about family and so much of Pesach is about multi-generations and so much of Pesach is about being able to connect with so many, so many different members of our family. So that's how we'll divide up tonight's conversation. And maybe I'm going to begin by handing it over to Aviva. I just want to point out, Aviva loves this stuff. She mamish loves being on the video, <laughs> loves doing stuff like this. So you can see the pure joy. She, 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 she could not, she, Julia's waving to you. I know. You know, she could not wait the whole day. Thanks, to be able, she was, she's been counting. She's like, is it time yet? Is it time yet? So Baruch Hashem. Now this is your, this is your shot at stardom. I know, right? Thanks. First of all, hi to everybody. It's so good to see all of your faces. Just want to point it out there. When I go on, I uh, I delete the video. What is it? I, I block myself. Yes. yes. So, um, so yeah, but it's really good to see all of you. So hi to everybody. Um, the goal of the Seder. The goal of the Seder, when we have children at the Seder, is for Vihigata Televincha, that we are, we're passing down our tradition to our children, and part of passing down tradition to our children is also sharing our love of Hashem and of Yiddishkeit with our children. And I think the biggest question that we really have is, how do we do that? You know, whether we're having a Seder with our immediate family, whether we're having a Seder, you know, Amir Hashem next year, we'll be back on track and you can have our bigger Sedarim. Um, but really the bottom line question is, is how do we make it exciting? And the truth is that really applies to us as adults as well, um, how do we make the Seder just, I guess you could say, more appealing? And every, you know, every one of us grew up in different ways where, you know, did you have to say every single word with every single Nakuda properly, you know, or, which is how I grew up, or do you have to, this you know, is, or... This is not a therapy <laughs> session, just to be clear. There's a whole bunch of people here. I know, but I know, I know. Your parents might be or... on here also, but it's, it's possible. <laughs> or, or is it that, you know, you can have English at the... Thanks, by the way. English at the Seder, Hebrew at the Seder, you can have a combination. The point is, it's, it's really nice to understand what you're saying, whether we have kids with us or it's just adults, or whether you're by yourself, you're a couple or a family. And... Um, and you want to have that that love, that excitement, and I think that that's really the most difficult thing. So that's what I would really like to talk about. How can we have some excitement at the Seder? Um, and I think what we have to really do is prepare ourselves. So it's, is it supposed to keep changing the pictures? Yeah, don't worry. Yeah? Okay, Jer Jer Jeremy's, so <laughs> Jeremy's got this. So, <laughs> so we have to prepare ourselves. We have to prepare ourselves as adults we have to prepare our children for the seder and it's hard because especially once you turn over your kitchen and then you start your cooking and you know at least from the woman's perspective you're sort of in that zone and that's how you're preparing for pesach instead of like sitting down opening up opening up a hagada and thinking like well what can i actually give over to somebody else in my family or what can i give for myself to prepare so that you feel prepared for the seder so I think that that's number one. 
having some preparation aside for all of the everything that we have to do in the house right now and everything that we have to do in the kitchen and the cooking to at least put it out there that take something from the Haggadah, give it to each of your kids, let them choose it, and then of course prepare yourself and that each adult prepares something that they feel that they can connect to at the Seder. Um, I think a very important piece to also to consider is that your Seder does not have to go till four o'clock in the morning for it to be like the holiest Seder possible, okay? You know, if it ends early, it can be a very meaningful, by the way. It doesn't I, have I, to end I, early. I, like, I just want to point I would it like have ours to they, <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully we will be ending early because I am not a night person, okay? Um, but it can end early as well and it could be just as meaningful, okay? The point is, is that we want to have something meaningful happening at the Seder. Connect to at least one thing. Um, I know you're going to talk about Pesach, Matzah, and Mar, but it's just something to really think about, which is, you know, what is it that you have to get done at the Seder, okay? But I'm going to leave that for later on. So if we can just choose one thing that you give to one of your kids or you take upon yourself so that you have that connection at the Seder. Um, you know, of course, it's very helpful if you have children at the Seder with you, you know, to have props or games. And if you don't have any of the bought ones, you know, the kids can prepare them at home and make them as long as you don't mind arts and crafts at this time. Candy is always really helpful to give out at the Seder. Um, and trying to keep kids and adults engaged at that time. It's, it's, it's really helpful to just know that everybody is coming to the Seder prepared. And if everybody can, as just reiterating a second, with everybody identifying a piece where they can have their Zavar Torah and they can say it. You know, children are obviously all different from one another. So you have some kids who will go on and on and on, and they love to talk about everything and anything, you know? And it's a beautiful thing, especially when it's Divrei Torah. But then you have some kids who they don't want to share anything, not because they have nothing to share. They're just not the sharing type. So it will be sharing. Um, do you want to continue on? Great. I, I think one of the, I, I know one of the things that we often discuss at our Seder, which Aviva and I don't necessarily see eye to eye <laughs> on, but it's okay. We have a wonderful marriage, Baruch Hashem, <laughs> which is that, you know, uh, Aviva definitely feels that this concept of uh, less is more by the Seder yes. is definitely... And, and the truth is, I, I think sometimes in our minds we have this idea that the paradigmatic, you know, beautiful and holy Seder goes until 4 o'clock in the morning and everybody's singing Shira Shirim and no one wants to go to sleep. So that's certainly beautiful if that's your Seder. I, I don't know that it necessarily works for most families. And I think that the notion that, which I think is what you're trying to really express, that at the end of the day, you could accomplish a lot in a relatively short amount of time. That's the goal. The goal is not to figure out how late the Seder could be. The goal is to figure out how can you maximize the amount of time you want to spend. So if a person says, you know what, like Aviva was saying, I'm not a night person, so I want to be finished by 12 o'clock, whatever your time is. 10 but, is even better, by the way. 10 is even better. <laughs> not possible, but good. 10 is better. <laughs> at, at the end of the day, so what do you want to focus on? Right? What The idea is, is, is preparation. Correct. And I think also this idea that it's not preparation for the Seder is not just for kids. It's for adults also. I think a lot of times the kids do come prepared. I mean, even in a year like this where they haven't had school for a couple of weeks, I know a lot of the schools are still working on their Haggadahs and still working on different things. So kids will come prepared. I think the challenge of preparation at the Seder is often not the kids. It is the adults. It's the adults that I think a lot of times we kind of roll into the Seder. We open up the Haggadah. We say, okay, I've done this before. No problem. I, I, know, I know how all of this works. I know when to break this, when to do this, when to take it off, when to put it on and everything. But the truth is those are the mechanistic details of the Seder. That's not what makes the Seder the Seder. And I think this notion of choosing something, choosing one thing that you could connect to. Like I know in our house, so Aviva always chooses a, one of the Haggadahs that has beautiful maizalach, beautiful stories. And it's beautiful when you bring stories to the Seder. 100%. So it's not a Dvar Torah in the, in the typical sense, but the truth is I mean, most people connect to stories even better than they connect to Dvar Torah. So I think this notion, choose something, prepare it. Great. Anything else? That's all. 
That's all. All right. <laughs> so maybe I, I'll I'll pick up a little bit, and we'll we'll Amir Hashem continue to go uh, to go back and forth. Um, so I guess may, maybe just to add on something, also a little a little bit with the children, that the goal of the seder is to make your children love Hashem. That's the goal. I've even mentioned this before, but that that is the goal. And I, I can't tell you just uh, before we transition to adults in just a moment. I can't tell you how many people I speak to who have such terrible childhood recollections of Sdarin. I was speaking with someone just a few months ago who told me I literally hate Pesach because growing up at my Sdarin was torture. I had to stay at the table the whole time. We read every single word. I feel like we've read every word 15 times and I hate it. And I hate it. And this was, this was a from individual, a good Jew, who said that he literally did not like the Seder because of how it was conducted. And I think, unfortunately, that's a process that plays out amongst in many homes. You could say the every single word of the Haggadah and ruin your kids. You could say every single word of the Haggadah and ruin Pesach for everyone. So again, as Aviva was saying, it's about figuring out what do you want to focus on? What do your kids need to hear? What do your kids need to know? What are the concepts you want to impart? What are the ideals you want to share? And how can you make it exciting, invigorating, and something meaningful to them? And understandable. And uh, meaning what? Meaning it could be in English. It doesn't have to be in Hebrew. Right. I mean, it, does, it could be in whatever language you want. If English is not your first language, it could just, it's just something that you should understand. Right, and I'll just say from a halachic perspective as well, it's important to know there is no part of the Seder that can't be done in English. Right? You, can, you could do any part, of, including all of the brachos, everything you have the ability to do in English if you want to. Certainly there's a beauty in Lashna Kodesh, there's a beauty in Hebrew, but to discharge the obligations of the night, one could read the entire Haggadah in, in, in English as well. Just, I guess, to, to build on this a little bit, it's also important, we were talking about this before, you know, the Haggadah, the ha pe people sometimes think that like the Haggadah is, it's like a Siddur. And so like to, in order to daven, in order to daven Shemona, so you have to say every single word. So in order to fulfill the mitzvah of the Haggadah, you have to say every single word. That is not the case, right? The, the Haggadah itself, the Haggadah itself is like a playbook. It's, it's a suggestion. These are, the, these are the areas that you should focus on. Like, you know, in, in our home very often, there'll be things that we will skip over the course of the over the course of the seder, not because they're unimportant, but because often we're able to convey it in you know as we say bal peh, you know without the text we're able to convey it outside. And I think this goes back probably to the preparation idea. Right. You have to you have to figure out what it is you want to do inside, what it is you want to do outside, what are the things you want to convey. Great. Anything else with kids? Props That's you spoke right. about? Yes. Prizes. Yep. Bribery. Yes. Good. Bribery is good, by the way. Bribery is very good. Bribery is good. Bribery is excellent <laughs> and strongly encouraged. Strongly encouraged. Okay, so maybe I'll transition, and you'll you'll jump in at, at any point in time. So maybe I'll transition just for a little bit to focus a bit more on the seder from the adult perspective. You know, as as I as I mentioned when we started out, this year is going to be different for many of us on on, on many levels, and I see even all the. Faces represented, Baruch Hashem, with the uh, close to 100 people that we have, more than 100 people between here and YouTube. I see already we have so many different people, and we have people who are going to be making Sdarim with family, but with smaller numbers of family. We have people who are going to be making Sdarim for the first time themselves. I see my son-in-law, Yosef Vizwadi, is on. I think my daughter-in-law is purposely, my daughter is purposely staying off camera. I think she's right next to him because I see him turning every once in a while as he's talking to himself, which, you know. You know, and, you know, my, my daughter and son-in-law are going to be making Seder for the first time themselves at home. There are older people who are going to be making Seder for the first time without their children. And then the very difficult dynamic that many of us are facing this year with making Seder alone. Many individuals will be having Seder in their home by themselves. And this is just a reality of, of the world in which we're living. And as I've mentioned many times, obviously everything is about contextualization. Everything is about context and a recognition that as difficult as this, as this Pesach is going to be for many different people in many different ways, Baruch Hashem, if the sacrifice that we have to make this year is not being together with loved ones, 
but it allows us to maintain our health and it allows us in Mirza Hashem to have many more Yomim Tovim then that is most definitely a sacrifice that is worth making. At the same time, we can't minimize the difficulty. It's a three-day Yom Tiv. You know, if it's Eretz Yisrael, then it's one day of Yom Tiv. Okay, it's three days. It's three days. Now, three days by itself. And the Seder, I, I want to tell you, I'm going to speak this in just a little bit, but who amongst us ever heard of a dynamic of people having a Seder alone? I, I, I can't remember in my life, you know, every year we do a second Seder at the shul, and we always make sure that for whatever reason, if there's someone who doesn't have a Seder, they have somewhere to be. In, in our communities, the notion of someone being alone, literally by, the, I don't mean alone with your spouse. I don't mean alone just with a couple of your kids. I mean alone is an incredible dynamic that is a reality this year that first of all requires us, those of us who are not alone, to be sensitive to those who are and to figure out again how we could reach out, how we could connect what we could do. Uh, we'll talk about that in a different context. But I think it also, but no matter what your Seder is going to look like, whether, like I said, you're going to be with a smaller amount of family, no family, with your spouse, or just by yourself, we all have to find meaning in this Yom Tov of Pesach. So what I'd like to try to do, just for a few minutes, and Aviva, please interject at, at any point in time, um, is kind of just to go ahead and go through the Seder a little bit, and really highlight some of the themes that I think resonate with incredible importance for us in this year and hopefully will resonate with importance no matter what your particular circumstances are. So we begin, of course, the Seder. I'm going to go just through quickly through the simonim of the Seder. So we go, we begin the Seder, of course, with Kaddish. Kaddish, we know, is simple, straightforward, Kiddish. But I'll point out something very interesting. There was a Haggadah that I've been using, excuse me, There's a Haggadah that uh, I, I picked up a couple of years ago um, called the Haggadah Shal Pesach Beis Aaron Beis Avram. It was written by, it was written by a Rav, Rav Avram Aaron Friedman, who was a Rav in Hungary. He was the Rav of a city called Chap. That was the name of the city in Hungary. He was a survivor of the war. And during the war, during the years, I think he was in Auschwitz, during his time in Auschwitz, he wrote a commentary on the Haggadah. Now, not only did he write a commentary, he wrote four simultaneous commentaries on the Haggadah. One of the commentaries is a commentary and a second commentary, and he wrote four commentaries in Auschwitz on the Haggadah. Just to show you, I don't know if you could see it, this is, this is the handwritten manuscript, if you could see it. I'll send out a picture of this also. So you can see literally he wrote it. This is his handwriting. So you can see how he wrote at the Haggadah, he remembered it by heart, and he wrote all of his commentaries literally by the side of the Haggadah. Um, and of course, they came out in print. I, I think it's relatively new in print, and I came across it a few years ago, and I've just simply been absolutely astounded by his commentaries. So the Rav of Chap, he makes an amazing observation. He says that in Kaddish, we know we make Kiddish. But the obvious question is, so then why is it called Kaddish? Why don't you just call it Kiddish? Yeah. Just call it Kiddish. So he says something amazing. He says the word Kaddish means, and I can't hear any of you, so I have to call on Aviva. I know I won't do that. I value my shalom values too much. So we, we know that, that, that again, that Kaddish literally means to sanctify. Kaddish means to sanctify. Kiddish means to recite Kiddish, right? Kaddish means to sanctify something. And the base Avram says something so beautiful. He says that the goal of the Seder night is to sanctify ourselves, is to sanctify ourselves. And I, I think so many times over the course of the Seder, we become so caught up in the mechanistic details, which of course are exceptionally important, but we sometimes forget a little bit about what it is that we're actually trying to accomplish on the night of the Seder. So the Rav of Chap says something amazing. He says, when we come to Kaddish, I have to ask myself a simple question. What do I need to do in order to increase holiness in my life? And, and I, I'm sharing these insights with you because I, I hope as, you, as we go on, you'll see no matter who you're making your Seder with or whether you're by yourself, these are themes that we can all internalize. To sit and to think about a simple question. How can I make myself holier? That's the avoda. That's the job of Kaddish. Urchatz. 
going through a little bit. So again, he writes over here in his commentary, a very beautiful idea. I'm going to quote, remember again, Orchatz, we know, is when we wash our hands. So remember again, this is not the hand washing for bread. We're all familiar with this. This is the hand washing before we eat karpas. Before we eat karpas. So without getting into the technical details. So we know, again, we wash before karpas because technically speaking, if you have a vegetable that comes in contact with liquid, you're supposed to wash your hands in order to avoid the transmission of ritual impurity. Now, the truth is, during the rest of the year, we never do this. Pesach night, we do it. And it's one of those things that we do in order to engage the kids, right? So it's, an, it's, an, it's, it's part of the Seder to draw the kids in. The kids see it, it looks strange. So the Rav of Chop says something so beautiful. He says, ultimately, again, what's Orchatz? So he says, I want to quote to you. He says, Yesh Lomar, li Avram Avinu. He says, we wash our hands as a remembrance to Avram Avinu. What did Avram Avinu do? Yikach no ma'atmai barachat surag lechem. After Avram Avinu had the bris mila, he had a circumcision in the advanced age. He's sitting at the entranceway of his tent. He wants to have guests come in. Guests come in, he thinks that they're just Arab nomads who worship idolatry. So he tells them to come in, but I want you to wash up. Wash your feet, because he thought they worshipped the dust. He didn't want anyone to bring idolatry into their homes. So the Pe'er Aaron, the Beis Aaron, says something amazing. He says, why do we do, or, why do, we do Orchatz? Orchatz means washing away the things that hold us back. All of us in life have things that hold us back. We all have stuff that just keeps us in place. And it's a variety of different things. For some people, it's fractured relationships. For some people, it's past failures. For others, it's shattered dreams. A whole variety of different things. Unhappiness with the self. And at a certain point in time, you have to wash away the stuff that holds you back. Avram said to his guest, you want to come into my house? You can but you gotta wash off the stuff that doesn't belong. We all have stuff that doesn't belong. And I think that this is incredibly important. You know, I, I just, Aviv and I talk about this a lot and I feel it's important to say, you know, there is so much discussion, so much discussion amongst people, like literally like mournful and lamenting how this year is not going to be the Pesach of our dreams. Right? And, and people literally are, are, are all upset and it's not gonna, and, and I, would, I would mention something that, that, that may come off a little bit strong, but I think we have to get over it. Meaning, I think at the end of the day, it is what it is. It is what it is. The world is a crazy place right now. Incredible things, overwhelming things are happening. And the sooner we accept the reality of our circumstances, the better we can go ahead and deal with them. You see, if I'm in the mindset of, oh, I wish it could be like this, or it should be like this, or it really, I wish, I wish, I wish, I wish, I wish, you could wish whatever you want. Sir, barring a miracle from HaKadosh Baruch Hu, which of course could happen, things are going to be the way they are. Things are going, and the moment we accept that, the moment we make peace with that, the moment we wash away the I wishes, because the I wishes aren't going to get me anywhere except exacerbate my pain and my sadness over what I thought it was going to be, but it's not going to be. The moment I wash that away and accept my circumstances, the better I'm re the more I'm ready to now maximize them. Because my dear friends, no matter who you're having your Seder with, it has the ability to be holy. I'm not going to say that it has the ability to be like it's always been or it's going to be just as great as last year. As... No, no. We have to be honest with ourselves. But just because something isn't really special. Orchat says, Orchat says that at the end of the day, wash away the stuff that's holding you back so you can maximize your circumstances. Next, Karpas. Karpas, we know, is the dipping of the vegetable in salt water. So maybe we have many... What did you use growing up? Potatoes. No. Didn't you use celery or bananas? No. <laughs> Potatoes. Okay, I, I think my wife used some strange stuff. <laughs> I don't know if my in-laws are on here. But, you know, so we take a vegetable. No? no. Potatoes. Okay. Sure. 
Island. Okay, so we go ahead and we take a vegetable and you dip it in salt water. And that's, and that's, we make a hot dama on it. So there's a lot of symbolism. Rabbi Nachman says something so beautiful. Rabbi Nachman of Breslov says that we go ahead and we take a potato. Why? He pokes out a potato. Do you see everyone's face by Karpas? See everyone's face by, it, it, it's an amazing thing. Right? We, ha- right, we have a whole <laughs> elaborate table, whole elaborate table, and there's going to be a beautiful meal. But when that potato and salt water comes around, right, okay. what happens? Oh, yeah. It's, it's you like jump. you jump. And you would think like it's caviar. Like, mamish, you would think that it's like short ribs or something that are being passed around over here. It's a fashtunkin of potato and salt water. And yet, again, people, mamish, go, go crazy. Okay, we're starving. It happens all that we're starving. Rabbi Nachman says something amazing. It teaches me that you can find happiness even even in a potato. Rabbi Nachman says that sometimes we think that true happiness requires incredible material trappings. That in order to really be happy, in order to really be basimcha, so you know, you have to have a lot of stuff. Or, or I think, again, to make it applicable for this year, that to have a lot of simcha, you need to have a lot of people around you. Of course, having a lot of people and having family is incredible. Just like having stuff is incredible. But sometimes you have to find the joy just in the potato. Sometimes you just have to find the joy in the little things that you have, even if at the end of the day you wish you had more. Yachatz. Yachatz, we know, is the breaking of the middle matzah. We go ahead and we take the larger part, we, set, we put it away for afikoman, and the middle part gets back inserted between the two whole matzahs. So I'll tell you something absolutely amazing. I saw in the, uh, in the Haggadah of the Be'er HaChayim, he quotes over here from the Tadik of Mendel of Riminov. And the Rebbe of Riminov says something absolutely amazing. I don't think I, I shared this with you. You'll pretend like you don't know it when I say it at the same time. So Rav Mendel Riminov says something so beautiful. He says that if you have two people, two friends, who care about each other deeply, care about each other deeply, so they're going to have to part ways. So what do they do? They take a photograph. They take a photograph that has both of them in it. And what do they do? They tear the photograph in half. So let's say do again. Do you mean a picture? A picture. A picture, okay. A photograph, picture. no? <laughs> a picture. Good. So good to give a share with your wife. <laughs> really, I recommend it. Hey, so so you, t- you, go, good. you go ahead and you take the, the photograph, the picture, and you, you, you rip it in half. You rip it in half. So let's say, imagine again, Reuven and Shimon are splitting up. So they, Reuven and Shimon have a picture together. They split it in half, and Reuven takes the part of the picture with Shimon, and Shimon takes the part of the picture with Reuven. And, and this way, even though they're separated, they each have a memento from one another. And the Rebbe of Mendel Riminov says, that's yachatz. That's yachatz. I break the matzah in half. I keep a part of it with me. That part of it with me is the picture of HaKadosh Baruch Hu. The afikomen that I put away for later, that's the picture of me, so to speak, that's given to HaKadosh Baruch Hu. And I thought it's such a beautiful idea, and especially, again, given this year, that so many of us are not going to get to experience Pesach with our loved ones. This notion that the Afikomen represents that even sometimes the matzah can't remain whole. And sometimes even people who love each other very much, they have to simply somehow make do with just a picture of the other. A picture of the other. The matzah split. I keep the part that represents the picture of HaKadosh Baruch Hu, and the Ribbon Shalom keeps the part of the picture that's supposed to be reminiscent of me. And I thought about this a lot. You know, someone, someone, um, someone mentioned to me that uh, there was an idea going around of leaving an, an empty chair at your Seder, you know, symbolizing the family members who you don't have around. So to me, an empty chair seems a bit morose. I would sooner say how beautiful it might be that if you're not going to have your family with you, keep pictures of them at the table. Keep pictures of them at the table. And the truth is, I was even thinking about this as I was preparing this today. How beautiful it would be, you know, I, I remember such fond memories that I have of, we didn't spend many Pesachs darim with my grandparents, but the few that we did were so beautiful and so wonderful. Imagine if we kept pictures of our grandparents on the table as well. You know, sometimes when you can't be with the people who you love, having their image with you can be something so impactful. 
and so incredibly beautiful. That's yachas. Next. Next, magid. So remember again, magid, magid is the, magid is the primary section of the Haggadah, where we tell over the story of the Haggadah. We tell over the story of the Exodus. We tell over the story. So I'll point out something very interesting here. So Magid really begins with Manishtana, right? Manishtana is kind of the springboard for the entirety of the Haggadah. Manishtana halayla zemikalios. That's the question, of course, and for many of us, whether as children we had the opportunity to ask it, or for those of us who are blessed with children, the incredible memories we have of when our children would go ahead and say that Manishtana. But I, I'm going to highlight for you an incredible halacha. The halacha says, the halacha says the following. Tan Rabbanon, so the, I'm sorry, the Mishnah says, Mazgulo Kosheni, when you pour the second cup, Kan Ben Shoel Asadif. So the son, the child, it doesn't have to be the son, the child asks the parent the Manishtana. Child asks the parent the Manishtana. So the Gemara says, what happens if one is having a Seder and he doesn't have a child there to ask the Manishtana? So the Gemara says, no problem. Ishto shoalto. Spouse, a spouse could ask. I says the Gemara, what happens if Rachman a person doesn't have a spouse to ask the questions? So the Gemara says, who shoel liatzmo? Who shoel liatzmo? Ultimately, again, a person should ask the manishtana themselves. A person, and it don't tell me, it's so strange. It's, again, I, I want to tell you, I've seen these halachas hundreds of times throughout the years, hundreds of times, and never did this halacha resonate with me like it does this year, right? Th this idea that a person is alone, so what do you do if you're alone for Yom Tiv and there's no one to ask the Manishtana? You ask it yourself. So strange, right? I'm going to sing Manishtana myself. I'm going to sit there at a table by myself and I'm going to sing Manishtana? That, that's, that's what I'm going to do. And then I'm going to answer, Doesn't that exacerbate the pain? Any of us who have ever been privileged to have say there with children know that beautiful moment where your child gets up to ask Manishtana, and of course at first they don't want to do it, and then you prod them and you right, bribe them, right? Whatever, <laughs> whatever you have to do, and then they ask, it's beautiful, and now I'm going to be by myself, and suddenly I go ahead and I ask the Manishtana, and I think that the Gemara was trying to teach us something incredibly amazing. You know, when Aaron's children died, on the day, actually, we'll read it in next week's parsha, parsha Shemini, when Aaron's sons die on the day of the consecration of the Mishkan, in a terrible, dramatic, and tragic event. So the Pasuk says, Vayidom Aaron. Aaron was silent, meaning that Aaron did not go ahead and ask any questions. He accepted what happened with a complete heart. So the great Tzadik, the Tefer Shlomo of Shlomo Radomsk, says something amazing. As great as Aaron was, David HaMelech was even greater. Why? Because by Aaron it says, Vayidom Aaron, he was silent. But what does it say by David HaMelech? Leman yizamercha kavod velo yidom. David HaMelech says, HaKadosh Baruch Hu, no matter what happens, I will not stop singing. Aaron was powerful. I will not be silenced. Aaron was incredible because in the midst of unspeakable tragedy, he accepted he was silent. He didn't question. He didn't ask why. He accepted. But David HaMelech did something even greater than acceptance. David HaMelech also had an incredible amount of tragedy in his life. But he didn't just accept it. He said, Hashem, I won't stop singing. I just won't stop singing. No matter what happens, I am not going to stop singing. And I think that's what Chazal are teaching us. My dear friends, even if someone's going to be alone for the Seder, you still have to sing. You have to sing for one simple reason. A Jew never stops singing. It doesn't matter how difficult the circumstances are. It doesn't matter how, and it doesn't even matter. I mean, of course it matters, but even though, again, a person might sit down by the Seder by themselves and an overwhelming feeling of sadness may envelop them. A person has to try to push through it. A person has to try to fight through it. A person has to try to say, you know what, I accept. Like we said before, Orchatz, 
I'm letting go. I, I, I know this year is going to be different than any other year. And I know that it's going to be different and it's not going to be as simchadik and it's not going to be as lebedik and it's not going to be as beautiful. I accept that. But now once I accept it, how do I maximize it? So the Gemara says, if there's no one else to ask the man, Nishtana, sing it yourself. Sing it yourself. And this leads me to another incredibly important part, which is that if you're doing the Seder yourself, so first of all, what I would say is, if a person's doing the Seder themselves and it's difficult and it's painful, you don't have to say the whole Haggadah. You know, we spoke about one of the past sheet room that there are only certain things you have to do. You have to make Yiddish, you have to drink the four cups, you have to tell over something about the Exodus, you have to say Pesach Matzah Mar, like we'll discuss, you have to eat, you have to bench, you have to drink the fourth cup. That's all you have to do. And so if a person is alone and they say, you know what? For me, it's better just to do a shorter Seder. Absolutely. That's totally fine. If you want to do a shorter Seder and then sit on the couch and relax and read a book, appropriate book, a good book, a kosher book, a halig book, then of course, if that's what you need to do for yourself, 100%. But you have to sing. Don't let a Seder go by without singing. You know, if your family is like my family, in my family we have some very unique tunes why are you laughing? <laughs> right, very, very unique tunes for certain things in the, in the Seder. Now, I, I am convinced that they've been in my family for generations. The only problem is no one but me knows them. My father doesn't know them. My grandfather didn't know them. So obviously, Your brother doesn't my know. brother doesn't know them. But I'm convinced they've been in my family for generations. And it's a big joke because when we start singing certain things, you know, the kids, everybody gets into it. Not because it's spiritually uplifting, but because it's a little bit of like comic relief. But that's okay. We all have those nigunim that are part of the Seder that either there was a father or a grandfather or an uncle, someone who is always off key, always off key. And usually it's the person who's off key who thinks he's really the choir at the great synagogue. Guy can't manage to carry a tune in the shower, but he, he's, he's able to go out and do all this. We, we, all, we all have those experiences. So sing those nigunim. Sing that. And although it might elicit a little bit of a twinge of pain because it'll remind you of the storm of yesteryear where you had your family or you had others or maybe a beloved spouse or maybe a beloved parent who's not with you anymore. But at least you're singing. Because the job of the Jew is always to continue to sing. Acceptance of HaKadosh Baruch Hu's judgment. And again, there is a, there is a level of divine judgment this year for all of us. Acceptance of divine judgment is good. But the ability to go ahead and sing, no matter what your circumstances, is even better. So make sure that you find the ability over the course of your Seder to Amir Hashem sing. Um, there's one other thing that I want to bring up over here with Manishtana, which is incredible. I saw that um, the Belzer Rebbe, the Belzer Rebbe says something absolutely amazing. The Belzer Rebbe quotes the, quotes the wording of the Gemara that says, like I mentioned before, the Mishnah, that says, Mazgulo Kosheni Vekana Ben Shoel. We pour the, the second cup, and it's here that the son asks. And of course, the son asking is a reference to, to Manishtana. The reference to Manishtana. And the Bells Rebbe says something so beautiful. He says, Vekan Haben Shoel means something different. Who's the son? Banim Atem Lashem Elokeichem. We are all children of the Ribbon Shalom. Pesach is a night of incredible miracles. And during this night of incredible miracles, it is so important to ask Hashem for the miracles that we need. And my dear friends, we all need miracles. Some of us need miracles of Shalom. Some of us need miracles of health. Some of us need miracles of Parnosa. We all need miracles. Some of us need miracles of reconciliation. Some of us need so many different kinds of miracles. And we forget that Pesach night, you know, this is why this goes out to what Aviva was saying before about the need for preparation. You know, we come to the Seder and we think it's all about how much matzah I need to eat in so much amount of time, how much wine I have to drink, how many potatoes I could sneak in, because you're only supposed to eat a little bit, but I'm starving, so I want to eat a little bit more. And we forget that Pesach is the night of miracles. And so the Belzer Rebbe says, on the Seder night, you know what the most important thing is? Ask Hashem for what you need. The Khan Haben Shoel means in the beginning of the Seder, the son, each of us are sons and daughters of HaKadosh Baruch Hu. 
And the Leo HaSeder is the night to ask the Ribbono Shel Olam for what we want and how much we need. How much we need. We need Rufua. Oh, we are so fortunate that our beautiful community of Baltimore, Baruch Hashem, Baruch Hashem, is not seeing the horrific scene that is unfolding in other communities across the world. We have to dab into our Kaddish Baruch Hu that he should send the Rufua to, again, our Jewish brothers and sisters and our mankind brothers and sisters throughout the world. And we have to dive into him that he spare our community from literally, again, the death and destruction that is engulfing other communities across the world. But don't just dive into Akhlesh Baruch Hu about COVID-19. What about for your children? What about for your marriage? What about for the neshama of your parents? The neshama of your spouse? What about the ability to find happiness? The ability to have the knowledge to raise whatever you need. The Kan Ben Shoel. Pesach night is the night where ultimately, again, we daven for what we need from HaKadosh Baruch Hu. We move on. Dayenu. So I'm skipping a little bit. Now, as, as Aviva mentioned before, a lot of stuff that you'll find, or I shouldn't say stuff, a lot of the things that you'll find in Magid are suggestions that the rabbis put there as a way of fueling conversation. But if you, for example, if you choose to skip that's a, lot, a number of those sections of the psukim, of the verses, that's okay. Because the goal ultimately is to go ahead and retell the Exodus narrative. And as long as you tell the story, ultimately, again, you fulfilled the obligation. So I'll skip to Dayenu, because Dayenu is an important one. Um, you know, Dayenu, also one that we love to, we, we, we have a little bit of an argument regarding Dayenu. I'm of the school of thought that the, uh, Day, Day, should I sing it? No, it's okay. No, good. So, <laughs> Day, 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 I'm of the feeling that, like, you should sing every single stanza. And my wife comes from the, um, the faster approach. Right, the faster <laughs> approach. So, and we only sing, like, every fifth one. And again, you know, I'm sure many homes you have this, so you have this machlokis and this tension, but okay, good. These, these, these should be our problems. Exactly. Good, good. Um, it's so, either that or I'm sleeping at the table. Yes, so. yes. Again, like I said, it's not therapy, so we don't have to get into <laughs> everything over here. So the interesting part with Dayenu is as follows. You know, when you look at Dayenu, Dayenu is an incredibly strange piece of the Haggadah because at the end of the day, you know, we say things like, had Hashem took us out of Egypt but not split the sea, Dayenu. Or Hashem split the sea, but, you know, didn't bring us to Eretz Yisrael, Dayenu. And the truth is, you look at it, and it's not true. It's not true, really. It would have been enough if God would have taken us out of Egypt and not split the sea. Is that true? Then what? We would have died by the Red Sea. That would have been enough. It would have been enough. Or it would have been enough if you brought us into the desert but didn't give us mun. Really? So what if, what, if you brought us in the desert and we didn't have mun, so would it have been better to die of starvation in the desert that, and, and not to go out? It's not true. And Rabbi Dr. Abraham Tversky says something so beautiful. He says, Dayenu doesn't literally mean it would have been enough, but rather it would have been enough for us to say thank you. Meaning that sometimes in life what ends up happening is we only say thank you to our Kaddish Baruch Hu, when everything is complete, when everything is as it should be, right? When, when there's equilibrium, when there's harmony, when all of the pieces fit into place, that's when I say thank you. But in fact, that's not the right approach to saying thank you. We have to learn to say thank you for every single thing, even when not all of the pieces are in place. We have to learn to say thank you, even when there are many things in a state of disarray, if there's something good, say thank you for it. Even if at the end of the day, there is so much imperfection. Don't wait to say thank you until all the pieces fall into place. Because the truth is, my friends, you know, rarely in life do all the pieces fall into place. So those who wait to say thank you until all the pieces fall into place, lose out on the opportunity to say thank you. Rather... Say thank you for the things that are good. Say thank you for the things that are working. And even if life is far from perfect, find something to say thank you to HaKadosh Baruch Hu for. And I think this is so incredibly important as well. Because we can't go into Pesach this year focusing on everything that's not right. right? And there's a lot of things that's not right. We don't have shul. 
A lot of us don't have family. A lot of us have no family at all around us. Some of us have less family. People are struggling now with financial related issues. So many different things. But you can't wait. So sometimes people say, well, everything is in such disarray. What is there to say thank you for? There's always something to say thank you for. Because Baruch Hashem, if you have food in the refrigerator, okay, it could be that you don't have every variation of kosher the Pesach food that you wanted. That, that's possible. But do you have what you need? Dayenu. There's a roof over my head? Dayenu. Baruch Hashem, hopefully everyone is healthy? Dayenu. Baruch Hashem, I'm doing all right? Dayenu. Dayenu doesn't mean it would have been enough and I need no more. We always need more. We always need more. But Dayenu means that Kaddish Baruch I'm not going to fall into the trap of not thanking you for things just because life is not perfect. I find the courage to say thank you, even in the midst of a sea of imperfection, for the things that are good, for the things that are working, and for the things that are beautiful. We then come to the end of Magid, and in the end of Magid, in the end of Magid, we come ultimately again to Rabbi Gamliel, right? So Rabbi Gamliel, Rabbi Gamliel said, that, and this is an important part of Magid, even if you want to skip a little bit, which some people like to do, they'll remain nameless, as some people like to skip. But even if you're one of these skippers, so ultimately, again, this is something you have to say, right? You must talk about Pesach, Matzah, and Maror. And you know, it dawned on me, I think for all of us, different things are taking on different levels of profundity, given the circumstances that we are currently in. So I think, for example, this year, Pesach, you know, why is the Yom Tov called Pesach? Pesach al Shum Ma, al Shum She Pesach Hakadosh Baruch Hu al Bate Avosim Mitzrayim. What happened on the night of the first Pesach? Hakadosh Baruch Hu said to us, "Stay in your house. Stay in your house." Right? Is is isn't this absolutely incredible? The first Pesach of our national existence, Hakadosh Baruch Hu said, "Stay inside. Don't leave. Don't leave. Whoever is living under the same roof with you." Those are the people that you're going to have Pesach with, and that is it. I think there's an incredible lesson. That and, and think about it. What was happening that night in Pesach? The angel of destruction was going throughout Egypt. Kadesh Baruch who says the Mashkis, the angel of destruction is going through Egypt. Stay in your house. Stay in your house. Don't leave. I think the lesson, which I think resonates with incredible importance for us in our contemporary situation is that sometimes HaKadosh Baruch Hu asks us to be active, and sometimes he asks, us, he asks us to be passive, to stay in the house and let him run the world. And I think this year, we're seeing a little bit of a greater degree of passivity. HaKadosh Baruch Hu is asking us to kind of shelter in place, to stay where we are, to not congregate, to not get together, but we have to hope that in the same way that in Mitzrayim, HaKadosh Baruch Hu said, stay in your home and let me do what I have to do. That hopefully again, we'll see that same incredible salvation this year as well. That if we kind of just remain indoors, we remain in our homes, we stay safe, we do what we need to protect our own health, even if it comes at the expense of gatherings with our family, which we love so much, that it'll give HaKadosh Baruch Hu the opportunity to do what needs to be done in the world and to bring in Geula. Matzah. Matzah is the second piece. Remember again, when it comes to matzah, Matzah is very interesting because matzah itself seems to be a bit inherently contradictory. On one hand, when we go ahead and we begin the Seder, we say halach ma'anya, we call matzah the bread of affliction. Then by the time you get to Rabbi Gamliel, matzah is defined as what? Matzah is defined as the bread of salvation. Why do we eat matzah? Because we have to leave Egypt so quickly that there was no time to allow the bread to rise. So which one is it? Is matzah the bread of affliction? Or is matzah the bread of redemption? And the answer is, yes. The answer is, like most things in life, it's whatever you choose to make of it. Matzah, different people see different things. Some people, when they look at matzah, they say, ah, cheres, freedom, incredible. Other people, when they say matzah, they say, ay, avdus, servitude, terrible. Same piece of matzah, same thing. Same big wafer, yet some people see salvation, some people see servitude. An incredible metaphor for life. Life is what 
you make of it. See, some people say life is a box of chocolates. I think la life is a pound of shmura. Life is a pound of shmura. And it's whatever you choose to make of it. You want to take your situation and say, Oi, Oi. After all, again, look, this is terrible. What kind of Pesach is this? What's happening over here? This is horrible. This is terrible. I can't believe this is not the way Pesach is supposed to look. Okay, you could look at it like that. Or you could say, you know what? It's certainly different than anything any of us have ever seen or imagined. But how do I maximize it? How do I make it beautiful? How do I bring out the meaning from this matzah? It's the same wafer. You just have to make a choice. Do you want to see servitude? Or do you want to see salvation? Murder is very interesting. Murder we know, and, and I, would, I would advise, generally I tell people, to use lettuce. To use lettuce, not horseradish. Generally it's hard for us all to eat a kezayis of horseradish. I don't know if it's healthy to eat a kezayis of horseradish. But you could use lettuce. And even lettuce, you could use romaine lettuce. You could even use iceberg lettuce. So the Gemara already discusses the use of lettuce. And the Gemara says, one second, how can you use lettuce? Lettuce is not bitter. So the Gemara says, ah, if you leave lettuce in the ground too long, it becomes bitter. So it's incredible because I think that there is a, an incredible lesson here. You see, in life, Mar, Mar represents, in, for the Seder, Mar represents the bitterness of servitude. But remember, again, the Seder is not just about the Seder. The Seder is about life. So when it comes to Mar, you know, all of us have things in life which make us bitter. But you know, when do things really become bitter? when you leave them in the ground too long. The longer you hold on to things, the more bitter you become. All of us have things that have happened to us in life that upset us, that make us angry, and that contribute to a sense of life bitterness. But you have a choice. Do you hold on to it? Do you let it sit in the fertile soil of your life and continue to get more bitter and more bitter and more bitter? Or do you just simply get rid of it? Murder only becomes murder when you let it sit in your kishkas. And so Pesach is an opportunity to say, what are the things in my life that make me bitter? And how kind of going back to Orchatz a little bit, how do I wash them away? How do I get rid of it? Because most things in life don't begin as bitter. It's only when you hold on to the wrong things, when you let them take root in the soil of your persona, that ultimately, again, they do become bitter. Korech, and this is incredibly important. Korech is the sandwich. You know, just as an aside, I mentioned this in a different shir. You know, Rav Soloveitchik points out, he says it's clear that the matzah they had in the times of the Beis HaMikdash was different than the matzah we have now, right? Because, you know, every year you make the korech sandwich. So what happens, you take your matzah, you take some lettuce, a little bit of charosas, you take a bite. And what happens when you take a bite? What happens falls, when you take a bite? Falls apart. Falls apart, right? It's a culinary catastrophe, right? The whole thing. And you think to yourself, why would anyone in their right mind make a sandwich like this? Like it makes no... Hillel was a smart man. Hillel was a very smart man. So who, like, who thought, like what? He didn't realize that, oh, I didn't realize this happened with the matzah. And like for 2,000 years, we haven't figured out that this is what's going to happen when you put everything together in front of a very, very tough wafer. You take one bite of it. And it's funny because you see people at the Seder, they take a bite, it crumbles everywhere. And you say this, like, people are like, whoa, like, wow, I can't believe that happened. <laughs> like, for some reason, they're shocked, like they were expecting somehow for it to melt in their mouths. Very interesting. Okay, that's a separate share. Rabbi Salvechik points out that it's clear that in the times of the Beis Hamikdash, they had soft matzos. So what did Hillel make? Hillel took carbon Pesach, lettuce, a little bit of haroses, and he rolled it up in a matzah. Or essentially what he made was a shawarma. Right? A lafa. A lafa. Oh, now this comes together. Now these can you imagine how far Eich naflu giborim, how far we have fallen. It used to be shwarma, now it's two pieces of shmura, some lettuce, a little bit of haroses, and all over my lap. Right? So absolutely, absolutely incredible. So again, what's interesting, Rabbi Jonathan Sachs says something so beautiful. He says, Why do we bring the matzah and the mar together? He says, Matzah represents salvation. Ma represents servitude. So Bissax points out that matzah and mar re really represent two different kinds of people. There are matzah people and there are mar people. Matzah people, Baruch Hashem, have a good setup in life. Life is going well for them. Life is going as expected. Things are playing out as they should. And then there are mar people. 
Mara people are people who have a really difficult time in life. And it's easy if you're a matzah person to forget about the Mara. And if you're a Mara person, it's difficult to ever think that maybe one day you'll have matzah. So what do we do? We bring everything together. To remind the matzah people that if you have a life of matzah, how fortunate you are. But don't forget those who have a life of maror. And this is incredibly important as well. Because especially over the course of this Pesach, you know, we have to, if we have neighbors or we have friends who are going to be alone for Pesach, and again, my friends, you understand, like, this is not an if, this is a reality. There will be people who will be alone. And we know who they are. And there are friends. And there are neighbors. And we sit next to them in shul. And we know them. Make sure that you connect with them before Yom Tiv. And again, you could also make a time to see them on Yom Tiv with proper social distancing outdoors. Don't go into their house. Don't go onto their porch. But you can say, you know what? I'm going to swing by your house at 4 o'clock in the afternoon. I'm going to walk by. Maybe you'll come out. We'll just exchange a few words. Not at 6 feet. At, at 20 foot distances. We should be makbit as much as we can with social distancing. But there's a way to create connections. So just because you have a matzah Pesach, remember those who aren't having a matzah Pesach and reach out to them. And if you feel like you're a little bit in a state of maror, don't think that just because seven days are going to be a little bit difficult, Pesach won't be as you wanted it to be. This doesn't have to define the rest of your life. This is a rough patch for many of us. It's more acute for those who will be alone. It's difficult for all of us. But in the words of Shlomo HaMelech, Gamze Ya'avar. Ultimately, again, Emir Tzashem, L'Shana Abba, not only will be together, but L'Shana Abba, Birushalayim. That's Korech. Shulchan Orech is our meal. That doesn't really require too much, uh, too much. But one thing I just want to say about Shulchan Orech, and I, I feel really strongly about this, and this is true, you know, especially if you're going to be privileged to have Seder with other people, you know, whoever is doing the cooking in your home, and, and I don't want to, I don't want to make, I don't want to say the, the woman of them, because maybe men are doing cooking also, but someone not is... Not in our house, by the way. What? The men. The men, yes, <laughs> yes. I contribute in other ways. I have different skill sets, but... but you know, sometimes what happens by the Seder is everybody gets to the meal, it's late, they're exhausted, and the truth is, remember, you put those three extra pieces of carpas in your pocket and you've been eating them over the course of Magid, <laughs> right? And then again, you're eating, oh, so, so much matzah, you get to the meal, and everybody, first of all, is exhausted, it's late. Somebody worked very hard to make that meal. Somebody worked very hard to make that meal. That meal should make sure that it gets the right covet and the right derech And I would say that even if it means that you rush your Seder a little bit so as to be able to go ahead and get to the meal at a normal hour so that whoever prepared the meal should get their proper due for working so hard, that's okay. We have it on record. It's okay to rush the Seder a little bit in order to be able to have a Bakavad they come to the meal. After Shulchan Orech, we come to Tzafon, the Afikomen, the Afikomen. And Tzafon is so important. Because you know, if you think about this in just a moment, the afikomen itself generates so much excitement, especially if a person is privileged to have a seder with children, right? So the afikomen generates so much excitement. Then what happens? The afikomen is hidden away. So sometimes, sometimes the simcha and the joy in life is not always apparent. Sometimes it's hidden away, but it's always there. Sometimes you just have to wait a little bit of time until the afikomen of simcha comes back out. And for even for those of us who are going to have a difficult Pesach this year and a more lonely Pesach this year, this does not define the rest of life. It's going to be a couple of difficult days. And yes, the first days are more difficult than the last days because of the Starim. But it's like the Afikomen. It might feel during the Starim that some of the Simcha is hidden away. But just like even when the Afikomen is hidden away, I know it's somewhere in the house. Even when Simcha seems to be a bit elusive, it's still there. Barech and Hallel. So Barech is when we bench. But Barech, I think, is also the term. What do we do in benching? We thank HaKadosh Baruch Hu for everything that He's given us. And I think one of the important things that we have to try to do over the course of our Seder is to stop and to say thank you. We're always so focused on what's missing. We all know what's missing this year for Pesach. But again, do we stop to say thank you to Hashem for what we have? Thank you, Hashem. 
Thank you, Hashem, for what I have. Benching Barich is the time where you take stock and you say thank you. And my friends, I would tell you, can't write it down, obviously, but just sit there for a few moments and list all of the things that you're thankful for in life. Because maybe you're not going to be spending Yom Tov with family, but Baruch Hashem, you still have family. Thank HaKadosh Baruch Hu for those Mishpacha members. Go through the list, and I'll tell you something amazing. I'll tell you something absolutely amazing. Do so you know what happens when you begin to say thank you for the things that you have? Baruch, that's saying thank you. Hallel. Suddenly you begin to realize how much you have to sing praise to HaKadosh Baruch Hu. Because my dear friends, the moment that you begin to think about and articulate the things that you have to be thankful for, you will realize that that list is bigger than you ever imagined. Barich is when you stop to say thank you. And once you start to say thank you, that leads into hal yirtza. With nirtza. In our house, many people feel, I'm not going to name any names, <laughs> but that nirtza is optional. And is not an integral part of the seder. I guess there are opinions like that. But okay, I'll tell you something amazing. So nirtza, the Arizal says something amazing. What's nirtza? Nirtza means it's been accepted, right? Nirtza kind of is like, the, the truth is in all seriousness, if you go to sleep after Nirtza, you're still a good Jew. You're okay. So what's Nirtza? Nirtza means it's been accepted. So the Arizal says something amazing. He says, you know, a person comes to the end of the Seder, a person comes to the end of the Seder, and he says to himself, you know what? I went through everything, I, but I didn't have enough Kavana. I could have had more concentration by the story. I could have said the story a little bit better. I could have had more concentration when I said the Barachas. I could have gone ahead and I could have, I could have sung a little bit more. I could have felt it a little bit more. Ah, I, I, and a person could like beat themselves up. It could have been so much better. That Rizal says, as long as you tried, Nirza. As long as you tried, it's good enough. Don't beat yourself up over it could have been better. As long as you, as long as you tried your best, and even if you could have tried harder, ultimately, again, all that Kaddish Baruch Hu wants from you is effort. And I think this is so incredibly important this year as well. For many of us, the Seder is going to look different. And maybe it's going to be harder to sing with the full heart like we usually do. Or it's going to be harder to go ahead and get in the mood like we usually do. Just try your best. Just try your best. Just put in your effort. You do have to make sure to sing because the Jew always sings. But just try to put in whatever effort you feel that you could summon up. And rest assured that if you put in whatever effort you can, Nirza, HaKadosh Baruch Hu is exceptionally happy. Because my dear friends, HaKadosh Baruch Hu sees the difficulties we have. And he knows that as much as we're trying to keep a positive disposition for the Yom Tov Pesach, and as much as we are trying to go ahead and be upbeat and be positive and be optimistic, the Leil HaSeder is going to be difficult for many of us. And HaKadosh Baruch Hu says, just try. And whatever you could do, whatever you accomplish, know that I accept your efforts with open arms. And whatever you're ready to put in, Nirza, I will wholly accept. And so my dear friends, we should be Zohar Mir Sashem. Anything else to add? Good. <laughs> so we should be Zohar Mir Sashem. First of all, as Aviva mentioned, to be able to engage our children for a beautiful Pesach experience. But to engage our children, we have to engage ourselves. And whether we're going to be with others or we're going to be by ourselves, hopefully this little crash course in the Simani HaSeder, in the different parts of the Seder, gives us little nuggets of meaning for each part of the journey. We each just have to try our best to create an atmosphere of holiness, whether we're doing it for our families or whether we're just doing it for ourselves. Just try our best and know that HaKadosh Baruch Hu will be so immensely grateful with any effort that we are able to put forward. We should be Zohar Mir Hashem. First of all, it's only Sunday night. And Pesach is not until Wednesday night. There is so much we can give. There is so much we can, there's so much that could change. Mashiach could come, Elio could come, Nisim, this is the month of miracles. So who knows what could happen? So we can't despair. But if it turns out that the world doesn't change all that much between now and ultimately Wednesday night, we'll go into the Seder, we'll conduct the Seder to the best of our ability. Kodesh Baruch Hu will see our efforts and Amir Tzashem, may our collective efforts be enough to tilt the Messianic scale. Maybe Zohar Amir Tzashem, that all of us come next Pesach 
We'll be together with our loved ones. We'll be together with our families. We'll be all of us together. Mir Hashem, Yerushalayim, Habnui, Meher, Abiyameinu. Amen. Amen. We thank everyone for tuning in tonight. Wishing everyone a Chag Kasher V'Sameach and a wonderful evening.